Abraham Lincoln, hard and gloomy at the North, and especially so to the President, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, after all the energies he put forth in the general direction of affairs. He was maligned and misrepresented and ridiculed, yet he opened not his mouth and kept his soul in patience, magnanimous, forbearing, and modest. In his manners and conduct, though entrusted with greater powers than any American before him had ever exercised, he showed no haughtiness, no resentments, no disdain, but was accessible to everybody who had any claim to his time, and was as simple and courteous as he had been in a private station. But what anxieties, what silent grief, what a burden had he to bear! And here was his greatness, which endeared him to the American heart, that he usurped no authority, offended no one, and claimed nothing, when most men, armed as he was with almost unlimited authority, would have been reserved, arrogant, and dictatorial. He did not even assume the cold dignity which Washington felt it necessary to put on, but shook hands, told stories, and uttered jokes as if he were without office on the prairies of Illinois. Yet all the while resolute in purpose and invincible in spirit, an impersonation of logical intellect before which everybody succumbed, as firm, when he saw his way clear, as Bismarck himself. His tact in managing men showed his native shrewdness and kindliness, as well as the value of all his early training in the arts of the politician. Always ready to listen, to give men free chance to relieve their minds and talk, he never directly antagonized their opinions, but deftly embodying an argument in an apt joke or story, would manage to switch them off from their own track to his own without their exactly perceiving the process. His innate courtesy often made him seem uncertain of his ground, but he probably had his own way quite as frequently as Andrew Jackson, and without that irascible old fighter's friction. But darker days were yet to come, and more perplexing duties had yet to be discharged. The president was obliged to retire McClellan from his command, when in August 1862 that general's procrastination could no longer be endured. McClellan had made no fatal blunders, was endeared to his men, and when it was obvious that he could not take Richmond, although within four miles of it at one time, he had made a successful and masterly retreat to Harrison's Landing. Yet the campaign against the Confederate capital had been a failure, as many believed, by reason of unnecessary delays on the part of the commander, and the president had to take the responsibility of sustaining or removing him. He chose the latter. What general would Lincoln select to succeed McClellan? He chose General John Pope, but not with the powers which had been conferred on McClellan. Pope had been graduated at West Point in 1842, had served with distinction in the Mexican War, and had also done good service in the West. But it was his misfortune at this time to lose the Second Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, when there was no necessity of lighting. He himself attributed his disaster to the inaction and disobedience of General Porter, who was cashiered for it, a verdict which was reversed by a careful military inquiry after the war. Pope's defeat was followed, although against the advice of the cabinet, by the restoration of McClellan, since Washington was again in danger. After he had put the capital in safety, McClellan advanced slowly against Lee, who had crossed the Potomac into Maryland with designs on Pennsylvania. He made his usual complaint of inadequate forces and exaggerated the forces of the enemy. He won, however, the Battle of Antietam. For, although the Confederates afterwards claimed that it was a drawn battle, they immediately retired, but even then failed to pursue his advantage and allowed Lee to recross the Potomac and escape, to the deep disgust of everybody and the grief of Lincoln. Encouraged by McClellan's continued inaction, Lee sent his cavalry under Stuart, who, with 2,000 men, encircled the Federal Army and made a raid into Pennsylvania, gathering supplies, and retired again into Virginia, unhindered and unharmed. The president now deprived McClellan again of his command, and that general's military career ended. He retired to private life, emerging again only as an unsuccessful Democratic candidate for the presidency against Lincoln in 1864. It was a difficult matter for Lincoln to decide upon a new general to command the Army of the Potomac. He made choice of Ambrose E. Burnside, the next in rank, a man of pleasing address and a gallant soldier, but not of sufficient abilities for the task imposed upon him. The result was the greatest military blunder of the whole war. But the idea of advancing directly upon Richmond through Fredericksburg, Burnside made the sad error of attacking equal forces strongly entrenched on the Fredericksburg Heights, while he advanced from the valley of the Rappahannock below, crossing the river under a plunging fire and attacking the enemy on the hill. It was a dismal slaughter, but Burnside magnanimously took the whole blame upon himself and was not disgraced, although removed from his command.
he did good service afterwards as a corps commander. It was soon after Burnside's unfortunate failure at Fredericksburg, perhaps the gloomiest period of the war, when military reverses saddened the whole North, and dissensions in the cabinet itself added to the embarrassments of the president, that Lincoln performed the most momentous act of his life, and probably the most important act of the whole war, in his final proclamation emancipating the slaves and utilizing them in the Union service as a military necessity. Ever since the beginning of hostilities had this act been urged upon the president by the anti-slavery men of the North, a body growing more intense and larger in numbers as the war advanced. But Lincoln remained steady to his original purpose of saving the Union, whether with or without slavery. Naturally and always opposed to slavery, he did not believe that he had any right to indulge his private feeling in violation of the constitutional limitations of his civil power, unless, as he said, measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution through the preservation of the nation. Thus, when in 1861 Fremont in Missouri proclaimed emancipation to the slaves of persistent rebels, although this was hailed with delight by vast numbers at the North, the president countermanded it as not yet an indispensable necessity. In March 1862, he approved acts of Congress legalizing General B.F. Butler's shrewd device of declaring all slaves of rebels in arms as contraband of war, and thus, when they came within the army lines, to be freed and used by the northern armies. In March, May, and July 1862, he made earnest appeals to the border states to favor compensated emancipation, because he foresaw that military emancipation would become necessary before long. When Lee was in Maryland and Pennsylvania, he felt that the time had arrived and awaited only some marked military success so that the measure should seem a mightier blow to the rebels and not a cry for help. And this was a necessary condition, for while hundreds of thousands of Democrats had joined the armies and had become Republicans for the war, in fact all the best generals and a large proportion of the soldiers of the North had been Democrats before the flag was fired on, yet the Democratic politicians of the pro-slavery type were still alive and active throughout the North doing all they could to discredit the national cause and hinder the government, and Lincoln intuitively knew that this act must commend itself to the great mass of the northern people, or it would be a colossal blunder. Therefore, when Lee had been driven back on September 22, 1862, the president issued a preliminary proclamation stating that he should again recommend Congress to favor an act tendering pecuniary aid to slaveholders in the states not in rebellion, who would adopt immediate or gradual abolishment of slavery within their limits, but that on the first day of January, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall be in rebellion against the United States, shall be thenceforward and forever free. And accordingly, in spite of Burnside's dreadful disaster before Fredericksburg on December 13th, unfavorable results in the fall elections throughout the North, much criticism of his course in the newly assembled Congress, and the unpopular necessity of more men and more money to be drawn from the loyal states. On January 1st, 1863, the courageous leader set forth his final and preemptory decree of emancipation. He issued it by virtue of the power in me vested as commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion. Of course, such an edict would have no immediate force in the remoter states controlled by the Confederate government, nor at the time did it produce any remarkable sensation except to arouse bitter animadversion at the North and renew desperation of the effort at the South. But it immediately began to reduce the workers on entrenchments and fortifications along the Confederate front and to increase those of the Federal forces, while soon also providing actual troops for the Union armies. And since it was subsequently endorsed by all the states, through an amendment to the Constitution by which slavery was forever prohibited in the states and territories of the United States, and in view of its immense consequences, the Emancipation Proclamation of Lincoln must be regarded as perhaps the culminating event in the war. It was his own act, and he accepted all the responsibilities. The abolition of slavery is therefore forever identified with the administration of Lincoln. In the early part of 1863, Lincoln relieved Burnside of his command and appointed General Joseph Hooker to succeed him. This officer had distinguished himself as a brilliant tactician. He was known as Fighting Joe, but he was rash. He made a bold and successful march, crossed the Rappahannock and Rapidan rivers, and advanced upon the enemy, but early in May 1863 was defeated at Chancellorsville in one of the bloodiest battles of the war. 
the confederates were now exceedingly elated and lee with a largely increased army of ninety thousand splendid fighting men resolved on invading pennsylvania in force evading hooker he passed through the shenandoah valley and about the middle of june was in pennsylvania before the union forces could be gathered to oppose him he took york and carlisle and threatened harrisburg the invasion filled the north with dismay hooker feeling his incompetency and on bad terms with halleck the general-in-chief asked to be relieved and his request was at once granted general george c meade was appointed his successor on june twenty eighth striking due north with all speed ably supported by a remarkable group of corps commanders and the veteran army of the potomac handsomely reinforced and keenly eager to fight meade brought lee to bay near the village of gettysburg and after three days of terrific fighting in which the losses of the two armies aggregated over forty five thousand men on the third of july he defeated lee's army and turned it rapidly southward this was the most decisive battle of the war and the most bloody finally lost by lee through his making the same mistake that burnside did at fredericksburg in attacking equal forces entrenched on a hill nothing was left to lee but to retreat across the potomac and meade an able but not a great captain made the mistake that mcclellan had made at antietam and not following up his advantage but allowing lee to escape into virginia to cap the climax of the union's successes on the fourth of july general ulysses s grant who had been operating against vicksburg on the mississippi during four months captured that city with thirty two thousand prisoners and a few days later port hudson with its garrison fell into his hands the signal combination of victories filled the north with enthusiasm and the president with profoundest gratitude it is true meade's failure to follow and capture lee was a bitter disappointment to lincoln the confederate commander might have been compelled to surrender to a flushed and conquering army a third larger than his own had meade pursued and attacked him and the war might perhaps virtually have ended yet lee's army was by no means routed and was in a dangerous mood while meade's losses had really been larger than his so that the federal general's caution does not lack military defenders nevertheless he was evidently not the man that had been sought for more than two years had now elapsed since the army of the potomac had been organized by mcclellan and yet it was no nearer the end which the president the war minister the cabinet and the generals had in view the capture of richmond thus far more than one hundred thousand men had been lost in the contest which the politicians had supposed was to be so brief not a single general had arisen at the east equal to the occasion only a few of the generals had seen important military service before the war and not one had evinced remarkable abilities although many had distinguished themselves for bravery and capacity to manage well an army corps each army commander had failed when great responsibilities had been imposed upon him not one came up to popular expectation the great soldier must be born as well as made it must be observed that up to this time in the autumn of eighteen sixty three the president had not only superintended the army of the potomac but had borne the chief burden of the government and the war at large cabinet meetings reports of generals quarrels of generals dissensions of political leaders impertinence of editors the premature pressure to emancipate slaves western campaigns the affairs of the navy and a thousand other things pressed upon his attention it was his custom to follow the movements of every army with a map before him and to be perfectly familiar with all the general and many of the detailed problems in every part of the vast field of war no man was ever more overworked it may be a question how far he was wise in himself attending to so many details and in giving directions to generals in high command and sometimes against the advice of men more experienced in military matters that is not for me to settle he seemed to bear the government and all the armies on head and heart as if the responsibility for everything was imposed upon him what had been the history in the east two years clouded by disasters mistakes and national disappointments with at last a breaking of the day and that in the west was ever a man more severely tried and yet in view of fatal errors on the part of generals the disobedience of orders and the unfriendly detractions of chase his able but self-important secretary of the treasury not a word of reproach had fallen from him he was still gentle conciliatory patient forgiving on all occasions and marvellously reticent and self-sustained his transcendent moral quality stood out before the world unquestioned whatever criticisms may be made as to the wisdom of all his acts but a brighter day was at hand the disasters of the east for gettysburg was but the retrieving of a desperate situation were compensated by great success in the west port donelson and columbus in eighteen sixty two vicksburg and port hudson in eighteen sixty three had been great achievements 
the Mississippi was cleared of hostile forts upon its banks and was opened to its mouth. New Orleans was occupied by Union troops. The finances were in good condition, for Chase had managed that great problem with brilliant effect. The national credit was restored, the navy had done wonders, and the southern coast was effectually blockaded. A war with England had been averted by the tact of Lincoln, rather than the diplomacy of Seward. Lincoln cordially sustained in his messages to Congress the financial schemes of the Secretary of the Treasury, and while he carefully watched, he did not interfere with the orders of the Secretary of the Navy. To Farragut, Foote, and Porter was great glory due for opening the Mississippi, as much as to Grant and Sherman for cutting the Confederate states in twain. Too much praise cannot be given to Chase for the restoration of the national credit, and Lincoln bore patiently his adverse criticism in view of his transcendent services. At this stage of public affairs in the latter part of 1863, General Grant was called from the West to take command of the Army of the Potomac. His great military abilities were known to the whole nation. Although a graduate of West Point, who had, when young, done good service under General Scott, his mature life had been a failure, and when the war broke out, he was engaged in the tanning business at Galena, Illinois, at a salary of $800. He offered his services to the governor of Illinois and was made a colonel of volunteers. Shortly after entering active service, he was made brigadier general, and his ability as a commander was soon apparent. He gradually rose to the command of the military district of southeast Missouri, then to the command of the great military rendezvous and depot at Cairo. Then followed his expedition, assisted by Commodore Foote, against Fort Henry on the Tennessee River in the early part of 1862, with no encouragement from Halleck, the commanding general at St. Louis. The capture of Fort Donelson on the Cumberland River came next, to the amazement and chagrin of the Confederate generals, for which he was made a major general of volunteers. This was a great service which resulted in the surrender of Generals Buckner and Johnston with 15,000 Confederate soldiers, 20,000 stands of arms, 48 pieces of artillery, and 3,000 horses. But this great success was nothing to the siege and capture of Vicksburg, July 4, 1863, which opened the Mississippi and divided the Confederacy, to say nothing of the surrender of nearly 30,000 men, 172 cannon, and 60,000 muskets. Then followed the great Battle of Chattanooga, which shed glory on Thomas, Sherman, Burnside, and Hooker, and raised still higher the military fame of Grant, who had planned and directed it. No general in the war had approached him in success and ability. The eyes of the nation were now upon him. Congress revived for him the grade of lieutenant general, and the conqueror of Vicksburg and Chattanooga received the honor on March 3, 1864, the first on whom the full rank had been conferred since Washington. The lieutenant general C conferred on Winfield Scott after the Mexican War was a special brevet title of honor, that rank not existing in our army. On the 8th of March, the president met the successful and fortunate general for the first time, and was delighted with his quiet modesty. On the next day, he gave him command of all the armies of the United States. Grant was given to understand that the work assigned to him personally was the capture of Richmond, but he was left to follow out his own plans and march to the Confederate capital by any route he saw fit. Henceforth, the president, feeling full of confidence, ceased to concern himself with the plans of the general commanding the Army of the Potomac. He did not even ask to know them. All he and the Secretary of War could do was to forward the plans of the lieutenant general and provide all the troops he wanted. Lincoln's anxieties, of course, remained, and he watched eagerly for news and was seen often at the War Department till late at night, waiting to learn what Grant was doing. But Grant was left with the whole military responsibility because he was evidently competent for it. The relief to Lincoln must have been immense. The history of the war from this time belongs to the life of Grant rather than of Lincoln. Suggestions to that successful soldier from civilians now were like those of the Dutch deputies when they undertook to lecture the great Marlborough on the art of war. To bring the war to a speedy close required the brain and the will and the energy of a military genius and the rapid and concentrated efforts of veteran soldiers disciplined by experience and inured to the toils and dangers of war. End of section 18.